listening to the Cross Kingdom Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message from Justin Carpenter. On behalf of me and the leadership and all of us, you've, you've helped relieve a whole lot of um, weight, you know, through this, through this time. So um, thank you so much. We love you all. And you're doing, doing an outstanding job. So, so what's that? Yeah, and I and I we always love reading on base camp, uh, you know how the connect groups are going, and it's like every time I read Wayne's connect group, it's like revival broke out, people got de- <laughs> people got delivered, people were healed. I mean, it's just it's amazing. Um, I've had it on my heart for a couple of weeks to kind of dive deeper into this whole issue of revival. I know it's a hot topic, and um, but I think there's too many things going on right now to ignore the reality of something started. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've had um, D- Dutch Sheets had that vision back, what, 10 years ago or so, um, and, and he saw campuses being set on fire all over the place and just a, a real move of God among young people. It is absolutely not a mistake that G- the Jesus Revolution came out when it did. <laughs> at the end of the movie, it was like I the very like the last. I don't want to ruin it, but at the end of the at the end of the movie, <laughs> okay. Anyways, y'all, y'all totally. Uh, I hear you, people. Chill. <laughs> You'll, you'll understand, but I, I, let me just say this without spoiling anything. Oh, man, I almost got shot up here. <laughs> but at the end, it was almost like there was an invitation from the Lord is what I felt. And, um, you know, it, it was just done so well. And if you go uh, to Harvest Church and actually read the whole history with Lonnie Frisbee, you know, he didn't, Lonnie died of AIDS, at 43 years old in 1993. Um, but the Lord used him tremendously. The vineyard movement helped got started. Because this hippie shows up and starts saying, Holy Spirit, come, and people started falling on the ground. And... Uh, you know, after watching that film, and you know, you it was what 1973 or 71 when Time Magazine came out, and I just believe with all my heart we're we're in another modern day Jesus revolution, yeah. and the, the the beautiful thing is we have a community right now where we didn't keep them out. We didn't. We didn't. We don't look at people as outcasts. We, we have open arms and we embrace everyone that comes in, no matter where they're at in their walk. And that was part of the beauty about with Chuck Smith and op- and him opening up his church to all these hippies that were. I mean, for real, they were hippies, and they and they came to the end of themselves, realizing that, you know, the whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing didn't fill them. But so many of them really thought they would find God on that path. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment and then think about our culture among youth today with all the confusion. It's like they're trying to find euphoria and yet there's so much gender confusion and all of these things. There's so many of the same components going on and yet now all of a sudden, I know Asbury closed you know, services at their campus and it got moved to a different location, but there's there's twenty something universities that are experiencing revival, and not just in one denomination. That that was the last number I heard. There there's um, a church in Georgia that's been in a baptism uh, revival for four years, and and like they're seeing people rededicate their lives and get rebaptized. As a sign of that, and when they're getting baptized, what's happening? People are getting healed. They're getting delivered. I mean, all these miracles are happening when they're literally getting immersed in the water. 
And so you, you see, I look back. I looked back two years ago, and I, <clears throat> I, I taught on, I, I called it the, the sound of rain. Anyways, I think it's better fitting at this point, the abundance of rain. And there's, there's a couple of key things that I believe that we have to understand in the midst of this, because I don't know about y'all, but as God continues to pour out and increase what he's doing, we actually want to abide in it. We actually want to steward it. We actually want it to become a part of our everyday life. We don't want to just visit uh, an upgrade of his presence and then go back to, to the norm. Re- revival is because you have lost something. Revival is because you have, you have fallen asleep and you need to be revived. Revival is absolutely for the church, but an on-fire church actually is what is needed to actually bring reformation to a nation. And we are, we are poised right now to, to be a part of stewarding this. And I was revisiting some dreams that a lady had that she gave to Dutch Sheets back a couple years ago. And, uh, but in Acts 3, which if y'all were here Wednesday night, we, we did a, an activation where we took that Acts 3 and we actually prayed the scriptures and asked the Lord to speak to us concerning that. It says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the, beginning of the, or since the world began. The Amplified says it this way, So repent, change your inner self, your old way of thinking, regret past sins, and return to God. Seek his purpose for your life so that your sins may be wiped away, blotted out, completely erased, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, restoring you like a cool wind on a hot day, and that he may send to you Jesus the Christ, who has been appointed for you, whom heaven must keep until the time of the complete restoration of all things about which God promised through the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. That's Acts three nineteen to 21. <clears throat> After Malachi, there was 400 years of silence. There was no revelation for 400 years. Can we all just say, thank you, Jesus, we didn't live during that 400 years? <laughs> that would be brutal. And... There was 400 years of silence, and all of a sudden, this wild dude called John the Baptist shows up on the scene. John was a forerunner, and John's whole goal was to prepare the way of the Lord. And we see it in Isaiah where it talks about him, and and it says that he'll send the spirit of Elijah. And uh, Jesus made it clear that John was Elijah for those who could receive it. And his whole goal was to preach repentance. Because repentance must come before revival comes. The the, the word repentance, a lot of times is, well, honestly, repentance isn't really talked about much in a lot of churches today. And it's evident when you walk into those places because of the, the, um, the culture doesn't look like heaven, it looks like the world. And repentance is actually a beautiful gift for all of us because it wipes the slate clean. Too too many times when we talk about this issue of repentance, we we, we tend to get worried about getting legalistic or, um, you know, getting too rigid. But without repentance, there is no salvation. It is impossible not to repent and be saved. Are you with me? And we, we've gone through, you know, in, in, in my old denomination that I was a part of did an amazing job 
with evangelism. But I also watched this culture there where people would come, they would say a prayer, they would leave the altar, and then there would never be repentance. There would never be any change in their life. And so therefore, there wasn't any times of refreshing from the Holy Spirit because they had not repented. And then I also saw in that as kind of a default, um, we would plan revival, which anybody knows you can't plan revival. Like we can do revival services, call them revival services, but you can't plan revival. When God chooses to sovereignly fall, that's, that's his business. We can't make him fall. We can position ourselves. Come on, Lord, let us have it. But we can't make them do it. And they would, so we would do revival meetings. And typically it was always a time for us to uh, at least stop sinning for a moment for that week of revival meetings. And then too many times we would fall, you know, you'd fall back into old, old habits, right? Old ruts. Repentance, when you look at the Hebrew and actually look at the pictograph meaning of the word repentance, it doesn't just mean to turn away, but it paints a picture of what you were abiding in, that house, totally burnt down to the ground with nothing left but ashes. So that even if you were tempted to turn back around, there's nothing there anymore because it was burned up by God's love. That, that, that is, it, so it's, it's not just us going, oh yeah, Lord, I agree with you. Because I can tell you, I could spend plenty of time right now um, talking about statistics with church culture and, and sexual immorality and, and how, how so many people in the church think it's okay if you're in a relationship to not be pure. The word fornication means sex outside of marriage, period. And, and it's not just that. I mean, I, I have lost count with dealing with people with pornography and everything else and there's they're amazing people but they have gotten hooks in them by the enemy we we have to embrace repentance in our life understanding that it is a gift regardless of what you're struggling with and it positions you for the holy spirit to bring refreshing on your life if back in in acts three it says that um When I use my little tablet, I tend to need my cheaters. Um, It says, so repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. In Acts 1, they're waiting for the promise. All the disciples are waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit from Jesus. If you back up in, in John chapter 20, He literally breathes on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. They are sealed with the Holy Spirit in that moment in John 20 by the resurrected Jesus. He says, receive, and he breathed on them. Ruach, breath, his spirit. But then he specifically tells them to wait until the Spirit comes upon them for the empowerment of ministry. And so you have this waiting period in Acts 1. You have the the promise in Acts 2. And then you see Gentiles beginning to get preached to as they move into Acts. You don't see the word revival in Acts because they're living revival. We we talk about going past the book of Acts, but I think we actually need to get back to the book of Acts. It says that just as Jesus was, so are we in this world. When, When I look at my life and I look at the life of Jesus... I am nowhere near operating at the level Jesus was. And there's no one in this room. And if you say you are, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. No. <laughs> but, but seriously, like we're all focused on the author and finisher of our faith. But there's this war, this tug of war of us wanting to, to go back to what is familiar, thinking that somehow... It almost killed us the first time, but maybe it'll give us life this second time. You're not in your right mind when you're doing that, people. That's the spirit of stupid. But we all have been there. All of us. Hello. You know, when, when, and, and when you're breaking free 
of things that have been super familiar in your bloodline. They feel natural. They feel normal. And you don't even recognize that there's demonic influence there. You think it's you. I believe a true marking of every move of God is repentance. It's salvation. When God moves, salvation's there, period. Every major move of God is, number one, first and foremost, reviving and bringing salvation. We're the ones that are being revived so we can see people come into the kingdom. Revival's a gift, but I, but I, but I also say I, 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 I want to live a life where I don't have to be revived. Are you with me? Yeah. We all need revival, period. And, and, and I'm like, I watched that Jesus revolution, and all I could do was weep. And I sat there and looked back. Every time God moved in my life in a significant way, there was a, a time of repentance that happened to me every single time. Um, in 2005, when Lisa came, it was a Saturday morning, and she said, you either get help or I'm leaving. That was a wake-up call that I wasn't okay. See, when Lisa and I got together and we started dating in, uh, in Pensacola, Florida in 96, I, told, I was very transparent about my past. Uh, you know, I told her I'd been molested, my parents were divorced, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, but don't worry, none of that affected me. <laughs> and I, I literally said, I'm fine, none of that affected me. That was my guardian lie, by the way, if you're wondering. And Lisa was like, oh, okay, well, I guess he's okay. So then we get married, 1999, and we realize we're not okay, people. And I realized I wasn't okay. And 2005 was the pivotal moment in my life. And guess what? It was all about repentance and healing and freedom. And I started running after the Lord with Theophostic Prayer Ministry for about a two-year period so I could actually become healthy or at least become tolerable to my wife, one or the other. <laughs> and, but I, something clicked in me in that moment, and I was like, you know what? I am sick and tired of being sick and tired, and I, I want to I do something about it. That was a pivotal moment in my life in 05. I would, I would not be here today had I not yielded and started dealing with my pain, period. Never, I, you, y'all are too much. I would not have been able to handle it. <laughs> And then you fast forward, and before the church plant, I hit the ground in my office, crying and repenting and asking the Lord to forgive me. And when I got up, I became obedient to planting Cross Kingdom Church. And I, I, it was a tug of war for a period of time. But every time I've seen God do something significant, it was always proceeded by me aligning what I thought and believed in my heart with what he desired. Y'all, when, when, um, when we're raising our children and we tell them don't go in the street, it's because they're going to get hit by a car, right? But it's like the enemy says, hey, all the fun's in the street. You should go to the street. They're... God's just trying to keep you from the street because he knows where that's where all the fun is. No, goofballs, you're going to get crushed by a car. And that's the reality. Too many times we look at, at warnings and, and, and look at things as if somehow we're missing out on fun. Somebody recently told me in the last week or two, I forgot who it was and it doesn't matter, I can't tell you, um, but, but they weren't sure if they were ready to really surrender their life to the Lord because they wanted to have fun. Now, there's a scripture. It says sin is pleasurable for a season, but then there's the consequences. Amen? But, y'all, anybody that's gone down, it says wide, right? Wides the road to destruction, narrows the path to life. You know, Jesus said something. He said, what I say to you, I say to everyone, stay awake. Stay awake. Watch and stay awake. Why? Because he knew how easy it would be for us to come into a place of slumber and, and begin to compromise and really end up 
having religion and not a relationship. Listen, even in a spirit-filled place, you can get into a place where it all just becomes rules and regulations to you. You can get into a place where you're performing for God's approval because, well, spiritual people fall on the ground when they get prayed for. So all of a sudden you find yourself acting when someone prays for you and you take a courtesy fall. That's what I call those. I, listen, we don't push people over in our community. If you ever get pushed, please tell me. And I, I'm being serious. We don't, we don't do that nonsense. But who's been pushed? Anybody been pushed before? Like half the place. <laughs> so, Lord, we just forgive the pushers. <laughs> But they're, they're, watch, they're, something's been coming alive in me in the last couple of weeks. And it, it really is just the simplicity of the gospel. Man, you, you, looked God, you looked at the Lord set Asbury on fire again. And y'all, they didn't have fancy lights. and I mean, it was just them. And all of a sudden, God fell. In fact, I read the... The guest speaker thought he totally blew it that morning, just totally messed it all up. And then all of a sudden, people are coming from all over the world. I, I want to mess a sermon up like that. I, I, wanna, I just, I just want to just be so horrible that he's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to show up anyways. And all of a sudden, we all get jacked up. But I want to I challenge you in this time. I, I want to challenge you to reflect your, uh, what's going on in your life, I, I want you to stop lying to yourselves and start praying very brave prayers like, Lord, show me what the enemy doesn't want me to see. Lord, show me where I'm more in love with something than you. Show me where this tug of war is right now with me growing closer to you. Y'all, good things, good things can become. I remember one time I came off a fast, and I just come off a fast, didn't really feel like I got a whole lot of breakthrough or anything. And um, I was like, Lord, is, is there anything else you want me to fast? And I heard coffee. <laughs> and I immediately began to manifest. <laughs> Now I wasn't manifesting. <laughs> but I literally heard coffee. And all of a sudden I was like, Lord, that's just dirty water. <laughs> but because um, I always drank coffee on my fast. There's confession. Water and coffee, you know, you got to stay hydrated. So, um, <laughs> so he tells me coffee. And I was like, I was like, all right, Lord. I said, I'll fast coffee. And literally the moment I said, okay, I'll fast coffee, he fell on me and healed me of, of, of pain I wasn't even aware of. Because my grandparents helped raise me, and I would wake up at 5-something in the morning with my grandpa, and I would have coffee, sugar, as if, I'm sorry, I would have milk with sugar, as if milk didn't have sugar in it. I had to soup it up some, and then he'd put a little splash of coffee, and I'd always drink coffee with him in the mornings before he left. So there was this tie here I didn't want to let go of because they passed in 2009, seven, my grandparents, seven weeks from each other. And, uh, when, and this all happened like in the midst of moving to, to Denver when we met Rich. You know, it says fire always falls on sacrifice, but it also says obedience is greater than sacrifice. You ever, you ever notice it's really easy to sacrifice things, not, not as easy sometimes to actually be obedient? You can actually be in rebellion and sacrifice. Right? I want you to hear my heart. I'm not saying that if 
everyone in this room deals with every little hidden thing that God has to fall on us and and explode the region and everybody comes from all over the world. I'm not, I mean, that'd be cool, but I'm not saying that that has to happen. I'm just saying there are things, there, there's little markers that we see through history of things that consistently need to take place in order for us to, reli- uh, to live a revived life. And the Holy Spirit is inside of you, right? And I, I believe with all my heart, God's desire when he comes and he starts pouring out like this, his heart is that we maintain that and, and, and steward that and grow that. And then when he comes again sovereignly and bumps it up again, there's a chart of your spiritual life like this, not like flatline back to life, flatline. And too many times in, in moves of the past, it seems like it was like we get really amazing and then all of a sudden, boom, R.T. Kendall back in the early 2000s stood in front of an entire charismatic movement and said, you think what you have is Isaac, but it's Ishmael. And he ticked a whole lot of people off in a room. He goes, you have Ishmael. He said, but Isaac is coming. And it wasn't too many years later, because this was on the cuffs of Toronto and Pensacola and all these things, and everybody was fired up, and literally just a few years later, and he said, leader after leader in recent years have come to him, and they said, R.T., do you, do you really think Isaac is coming? And metaphorically, meaning for what we, what we really want. So I want to encourage you, if you're holding on to, to Ishmael, I believe with all my heart prophetically, when you're called, when God has a calling on your life, there are certain things that he does consistently in every individual's life. One is that we get a call and we try to help God fulfill it. Anybody been there? And all of a sudden we find ourselves with Ishmael. And then we go, well, okay, Lord. And then he gives you Isaac. You get super excited again until you have to put him on the altar. And what he's doing is he's crushing your false identity so that you don't puff up with pride and think that you're the source of what he's doing. I'm convinced that he can use anybody he wants. He, he just chooses to move through us. And so I, when I see God do amazing things, I'm just like, Lord, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to see this. Thank you for me to be a part of this. Because he, we can't lose track of humility in the midst of all of this. In fact, I'm convinced many times God doesn't do what he really wants to do through us because that level of power would destroy us in that moment. We wouldn't be able to steward it. Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there's a sound of the rushing of rain. Two years ago when I read those dreams about the, remember, anybody remember the dream the the lady had with the the eagles? There was a hundred eagles and the three arrows and the scroll. After I read that, and it was uh, February of 2021, I think, when I talked on it, over the next three days, I literally was feeling spiritual rain hit my arm. I would feel drops of rain hit my left arm. And I'd like look up and and one time it was in the church and and it was you know over a three or four day period, and I I took that as a promise from the Lord that we would get an arrow. And I'm I'm gonna re- I'll finish with reading that dream because I believe it's significant because I, I I believe that metaphorically these eagles are flying right now and and I believe arrows are gonna begin to fall. He says, go up and eat and drink, for there's a sound of the rushing of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up on the top of Mount Carmel. And he bowed himself down on the earth, and he put his face between his knees, and he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And he said, go again, seven times. And at the seventh time, he said, behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. 
And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab at the entrance. Ahab's on a horse. He girds up his pants, and he supernaturally outruns a horse. You know, there's a scripture that says, if you get tired of running with men, how are you going to run with the horses? Well, he ran with the horses, and he wasn't tired. That'd be kind of cool, huh? See my little tiny legs moving that quick? (laughs) Look like a cartoon character. Maybe after that run, this would shrink. Um, But he said he saw a cloud the size of a hand. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. I would say at this point in juncture, where we're at right now, we have more than a hand. We're seeing more than a hand. We're seeing God begin to set places on fire all over our country. There's more than a hand. It's kind of like all of a sudden Jeremiah reads Daniel And he goes, oh, my goodness, it's 70 years. Now I'm going to seek the Lord what to do. It says by the scriptures he understood. So he had the scroll of Jeremiah. He did the math. It's 70 years. I'm going to inquire of the Lord. And boom, as he began to inquire of the Lord because he knew the times and seasons, encounters of God began to happen, and he saw the end of the history. Well, we have more than a cloud We need to understand the times and seasons we're in. I would say now is the time to seek the Lord in ways you've never sought him before. First and foremost, so that you can have intimacy with him, not twist his arm. You can fast all you want. God's not up there going, oh, I can't handle, not not 24 or more hours, son. Oh, my goodness. Let me tell you something. I think the Holy Spirit sometimes like my wife, where I was on day five of a water fast the water, water line broke in the office, and I, I mean, literally day five, maybe seven, on water only. Did I say water only? Maybe some coffee. And she had me moving furniture out of the office. And when I went to intercessory wine, she was like, the Lord knew you were going to be fasting, knew this was going to happen. I needed to fast another seven days because I was not spiritual in that moment. <laughs> So, I'm sure the Lord was laughing at me. The point is, again, we seek the Lord. It's kind of like with his appointed feast, he's always found. I think there's a Kairos moment we're in right now where it, you can seek him and, and his presence is there. It's like he's answering even before you ask. I had a dream some years ago, and and the dream started, there was a house, I think I've shared this once or twice, there was the main house and there were smaller houses. I enter into this dream, and Bill Johnson comes out of the main house. I, I, this was way, way before Cross Kingdom, and there was young people all over the place on the sides of the houses, and I go, Bill... When did you get here? He says, oh, I've been here for a while. And I knew that what God wanted to do here was similar to what he was doing with a movement in Reading, and he was waiting. Oh, I've been here for a while. I believe all the words that have been prophesied over this house. I, I believe the words that God wants to start a movement here. With, with with a whole lot of faceless, nameless people. None of us are famous. But we're all just running. Well, Sean Kendrick's famous, but yeah. <laughs> For the rest of us, little peons. God, but God, God wants to move in a mighty way. But there's something at the heart of all of this that we have to grab a hold of and not lose. And that is, our heart should long to be in the tent of his presence, first and foremost. When Moses went out, Joshua stayed in. As many are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And again, it's us beginning to live a life totally surrendered unto the Holy Spirit to where we actually are, we are aligned and aware of his leading 
He will never lead you into darkness, meaning into sin. He will never take you into a place to harm you, but always to promote you. And when he says stop, it's not because he's punishing you. It's out of his love so he can prepare you for what's to come. If Jesus himself spent 30 years on planet earth not doing ministry, folks, be patient, please. I'm saying that to myself too. So I don't, I don't, I don't know everything that's coming. I, by any means, I don't know where we'll be 24 months from now. But as long as we're together and we're with Jesus and we're, pl- and we're plowing ground, we're pioneering and we're plundering hell, I'm going to be a happy camper. Yeah. Let me finish up with... Uh, Do you, uh, y'all, do you remember her name? I'm not sure if I wrote it down. Oh, Gina Golston. Have you all heard of her? She was the one that had the dreams with that and gave them to Dutch Sheets. On January 14th, 2020, this is pre-COVID, I dreamed I was at the Red River Meeting House in Russellville, Kentucky. I'd gone through the gate and started walking up the driveway toward the meeting house when I noticed a hundred bald eagles on the grounds. I was captivated by the sight of so many eagles. Here, she eagles, for those of you who were in the class Wednesday night. Um, that was a female eagle. We created that name Wednesday. Um, hearing a noble, or I'm sorry, hearing a noise behind me, I turned and saw the older well, uh, an, I saw an older well drilling rig coming through the gate toward the meeting house. It stopped about halfway up the driveway and parked under a walnut tree and then began drilling. No sooner had the bit been set when, whoosh, the water gushed out in a very high massive amount. I thought, this looks like Old Faithful. I've seen Old Faithful, and this reminded me of that famous geyser, only it was much larger in the dream. I thought about how Old Faithful is very predictable and, and erupts in a rhythm of time. Then I heard an audible voice speaking about this geyser. It is set on the rhythm of heaven's time clock, and it's time. In the dream, I understood that to mean it's blown before a gushing move of the Spirit of God, but it's set for another greater gusher, and it's time. Next, I saw two hands come down and clap one time. It was a very loud sound. It was a signal to the eagles. They weren't scared by the noise of the clap or by the spraying of the water. They calmly rose up, hovering like a helicopter, ready to fly. As they rose, I saw that each eagle had arrows in one of their talons and a rolled up paper in the other. Then I heard the same audible voice say, rapid eye movement. My seers are on the move. As soon as I heard those words, the eagles flew off in every direction, each uh, heading purposefully toward their assignment. As they left, each one flew through the supernatural water, becoming drenched. Incredibly, Their feathers never dried as they flew. Wherever they traveled, the water would fall off of them like a rain shower onto the dry ground where they flew. Back at the Red River Meeting House, the water continued gushing, and I also became soaked with it. I went into the meeting house, which I realized had been set up to be a command center. There were seven drafting tables with architects sitting at them, drawing up blueprints, plans, strategies, revelations, People were coming in one after another, soaked with the water from the geyser. They would approach one of the architects who would roll up a set of plans and hand it to them. Immediately, the architects had another one drawn up and would hand it off to the next soaked person walking in. I was amazed at the speed at which the architects worked. Draw it, roll it up, hand it off. Draw it, roll it up, hand it off. The sequence didn't stop. When the people received their blueprints, they were supernaturally transported to their assignments in America and around the world. And just as occurred with the eagles, the revival water soaking them was being flung onto the people everywhere they went. 
I heard the audible voice again say, rapid response teams. Then I noticed a sign on the wall behind the pulpit that read, rapid response command center. Suddenly the dream shifted, and I knew by the spirit that what was happening at the Red River Meeting House was also taking place at Cane Ridge, Kentucky, Azusa Street in California, and I was then lifted up and could see a line running north and south connecting Cane Ridge and the Red River Meeting House. Another line from each of them went to Azusa. I could see that these lines formed the shape of the spearhead. From the line drawn between Cane Ridge and Red River Meeting House was yet another. Coming to the nation of Wales to the east, it was forming the shaft of the spear. This picture was depicting that all four of those places, Wales, Cane Ridge, Red River Meeting House, and Azuzu, were connected, and also that what I was, uh, was happening at Red River was simultaneously happening at all of them. I was being shown that all of those past moves of God were now being brought together to spearhead another greater and more powerful move of God in our time. She had that dream in, in February 1st of 2020. And then she had a, a, a shorter one on February 2nd. And again, the eagles were there. And she saw a man, and she could feel, feel a real strong anointing from him. And as they were looking down, we saw the first appeared to be warplanes, but they were actually the eagles. She found out as she looked closer. And they were not uh, warplanes, but eagles. And there was, again, a hundred of them. And they were carrying water from the well of revival at the Red River House. It had been unlocked and gushing forth into the nation. I could clearly see that just as the previous dream, the eagles were carrying arrows in one of their talons and a rolled up piece of paper in the other. Also, they were still wet and dripping water from the geyser that drenched them at the Red River Meeting House. As the eagles flew through America, they all simultaneously began diving when nearing the ground, they leveled off and began dropping their arrows in the land. I knew there were a hundred eagles, each carrying three arrows. Three hundred arrows were released. Isn't that interesting? Kind of like the three hundred David's mighty men throughout America. And each arrow hit the ground, ignited, and though it had hit a gas pocket, and a spiraling plume of fire shot up. We watched as the water the eagles were releasing was also ignited by the fire. This revival water from the Red River Meeting House was extremely flammable and instantly caught fire. It seemed as though all of America was on fire, the fire of revival. And it goes on, but the, uh, and the person she saw in the dream was Duncan Campbell, who was one of the leaders of the great uh, Hebrides revival. Notice in that dream, when they dropped, it was an explosion, immediate explosion. What do you see happening in all these universities right now? Literally, in a moment they didn't think, boom, there's an immediate explosion of the fire of God, and the revival fire hits. This started with the youth, but, not, but will not stay only with the youth. But it started with the youth because this generation is the future. It started with the youth because they, I believe, many times can handle God move and, and not try to market it, not try to make a name for it. There were many charismatic leaders that showed up to Asbury, and they were all told to have a seat. So, in, in a moment we think not, there's going to be an explosion. I believe with all my heart, there's going to be an explosion of the fire of God in our midst. And I don't know if it's today, tomorrow, next week, next month. I don't know, but I believe with all my heart, we're going to see an explosion hit us. And as one of the shepherds, I want to do my part to be in a place where I can steward it and then help as many people be in a place when it hits. We can, we can steward this and, and, and see it sustained. That is, my, that is one big burden I have. I've never gone through a move of God like that, 
so we're all going to grow together. <laughs> but I just want to challenge y'all, when, when, as God continues to move in our midst and, and move heavier and heavier, and all of a sudden we have an ignition, let's stay humble, hungry, and teachable so we can see this thing stewarded and handed off to our kids. Because that's spiritual legacy. We don't want to be um, like uh, Hezekiah, where God extended his life 15 years, but then was told, what? Was told his kids were going to be taken away in captivity, and he was only focused on his moment right there, and he goes, well, at least we'll have peace in my day. So let's stand. And if you all uh, need to grab your kids, I'm sure they're ready. So, during worship, I saw in the spirit uh, an angel with a trumpet, and I saw trumpets. Anybody see any trumpets? during worship in the spirit at all. And um, Susan asked me what cranes meant um, prophetically. I Googled because that means that's when it says it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of a king to search it out. That means Google. And so I, I Googled it. And one of the types of cranes is actually called a trumpeter, a trumpet. So I thought that was very interesting. Not saying we have all that figured out yet, but um, that that's definitely good, not bad, right? <laughs> I'm just thankful that as the Lord has been increasing in our midst, because we can see a steady climb in, over a period of time, that he's still doing this. He's still going up. So, yeah, Lord more. Father, I ask that one of those awesome eagles dripping with revival water, Lord, would drop the spear and we would ignite. Lord, ignite us for you, Lord Jesus. Not so we can just have great meetings, but that we can be transformed into your image so that we can take the gospel of the kingdom and get it in front of those that are lost so we can see salvations, so we can see healings. Lord, we can see your kingdom come in power, Lord, not just in word, because you said the kingdom is power. And so we ask, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would cause your spirit to fall, to pour out, Lord, this Acts 2 season and, and fulfillment that we're living in right now, Lord, that everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and that you're pouring out with dreams and visions, Lord, and you're bringing us into a place of maturation so that we look like you. So, Father, we want your kingdom. We want your will, not ours. Lord, as you begin to spotlight areas of our lives that need to come under your lordship, Jesus, may we not argue, may we not uh, complain, but may we surrender and embrace your loving fire. And I just ask that your, your fire, Lord, your love would come and purge and draw us closer. Lord, you said, prepare, because I'm going to meet with you in three days. And when you hear the trumpet sound, come to the mountain. Lord, we, we recognize that in this moment, this is a Kairos moment. Lord, trumpets are sounding, fires are starting, and you're saying, prepare yourself because I'm coming. And Lord, we acknowledge that and we're preparing and we say, even so, Jesus, come, ignite us, glorify your name, that your name would be lifted up and not ours, and that we would see this region, Lord, totally transformed under your lordship, that we would be a kingdom region and that we would see people sent out all over the earth to preach your word and to make disciples of nations, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you for listening. 
for more messages and other resources, please subscribe to this podcast or go to our website at www.crosskingdom.org.